Imagine a world in which there is no friction, in which electric current can flow with no resistance, where as you decrease the temperature of a particular substance, its resistance will fall. But then at a particular moment, that resistance will suddenly drop to zero and be zero forever then. This temperature is known as the critical temperature. And this phenomenon is known as superconductivity. The origins of the word superconductivity can be thought of as essentially electric current flowing with no resistance. Essentially a conductor which conducts electricity perfectly with no losses whatsoever. So what makes a substance superconducting? First of all, it's the inherent properties of the substance. And secondly, it's the low temperatures. Now, the highest of such low temperatures to this day is negative 109 degrees Celsius, which is very cold. It belongs to the superconductor Hg Ba2 Ca2 Cu3 O8. And this substance is known as a high temperature superconductor, although it may not seem very high temperature. However, it's the highest of the low temperatures known to date. Now, let's talk about what causes the superconducting state in the first place. Think of the superconducting state as a special quantum condensation of electrons. Think of it as electrons becoming coherent. Quantum mechanically, they start to behave as a single wave function. Think of it from a physics, electricity, and magnetism perspective. In ENM, we know that paramagnetic substances are magnetizable. When you apply a magnetic field to them, an external B field, the spins of the electrons within the substance become aligned, causing the substance to acquire a magnetic moment, which in turn makes it behave like a magnet. So all of the spins, or most of the spins, a large majority of the spins in a paramagnetic substance will become aligned upon placement into an external B field. However, if you turn the temperature up of this particular substance, then some of these spins, let's say this one, this one, and this one, will all of a sudden flip the other way. And you will lose that coherence. You will lose that perfect alignment into the same direction. Hence, you will lose the magnetic moment. Hence, the substance will cease to behave as a magnet. This is essentially thermal agitation. Temperature is beginning to compete with the alignment of the spins of the electrons within the substance. And hence, it's competing with the inherent magnetism, the magnetism that you are inducing upon this paramagnetic substance. A very similar thing happens in our superconducting state in terms of electrons becoming coherent. So think of that as being the superconducting state has this perfect quantum state, and then suddenly you just ruin it. And to ruin it, we'll talk about what that means. Essentially, the superconductor starts to behave as just an old regular conductor. And the way to ruin it is either through temperature changes or through magnetic field changes. Now, speaking of magnetic fields, when a substance is in a superconducting state, it, it behaves very interestingly um, in terms of these magnetic fields. It pushes all of the magnetic fields out of the substance. What this means is, graphically, if we have a substance into which, which we place into an external magnetic field, here, the magnetic field lines penetrate the substance. However, in the superconducting state, these magnetic field lines will not penetrate the substance. They will be effectively pushed out. Now, how do you think of that? To think of it, quite simply, remember that if you apply a magnetic field to a substance, you induce current. So imagine that this substance that we are talking about is a cylinder in shape, and it's placed into an external magnetic field. What will happen is you will have these currents start to flow on the surface of the substance. And when they start to flow, they will in turn make an induced magnetic field within the substance, which will in turn cancel the external magnetic field that is being applied to the substance. So when we say that the superconducting state pushes out 
the magnetic field lines. What that means is that the field lines essentially cancel. And this effect is a very famous effect known as the Meissner effect. Now, as you might imagine, not only is the critical temperature important to maintaining a superconducting state, but also the critical magnetic field strength is vital. And in fact, it turns out that if you increase the magnetic field, then you effectively decrease the critical temperature because it is harder to achieve that critical temperature. It, is, it takes more energy to get the substance to achieve that critical temperature and have to become superconductive. Now, from a graphical point of view, if we plot temperature versus magnetic field, it will look something like this, where this is the critical field after which the substance essentially is normal, and within here, it's superconducting. And at each one of these points inside, you have a particular critical temperature for each B field strength individually. So this is, for example, the critical field, the critical temperature in B1, or this is B1. Mathematically, and this is one of the simpler equations of superconductivity, we write that the critical temperature at a specific magnetic field strength is equal to the critical temperature at zero magnetic field strength times the square root of 1 minus the magnetic field strength, and once again, when we say magnetic field strength, we mean external magnetic field strength, divided by the inherent critical magnetic field strength of the substance that actually makes it a superconductor. Now, everything that we've talked about so far deals with type 1 superconductors. Essentially, you think of them as a now you see it, now you don't phenomenon. At first, it was a superconductor, and then suddenly it becomes a normal conductor. Now, the other type of superconductor is known as a type 2 superconductor. And these type 2 superconductors, they are different because they have a state, like a limbo state, in between the superconducting state and the normal state. Graphically, they have this state where you have the substance behaving as a superconductor, but then you have the state where it's behaving sort of like a superconductor, but sort of like a normal conductor, and then you have the normal state. And the state that is referred to, well, that I called the limbo state effectively, is known as the vortex state. And this vortex state is a very interesting state where if you have this substance, Certain regions, let's say from here to here, are normal, but certain parts of it are superconductive. So as, as we mentioned, uh, let's say you shoot a magnetic field line, it encounters this superconducting part, and it's like, we can't go through there, we have to go through the normal. So magnetic field lines penetrate parts of the superconductor, they penetrate the normal regions, however, the superconducting regions are not penetrated. Hence, the superconductor is behaving both, the substance is behaving both as a superconductor and a normal conductor at the same time. And in practice, we actually, we can actually make a type 2 superconductor from a type 1 superconductor simply by introducing an alloying element. For example, you can add indium to lead, and you would make it. Why you would want to care to do something like this? Well, you can actually use this in a very interesting application with superconducting magnets, which produce, for example, maglev trains, which you might have heard of. Um, these particular superconducting magnets can withstand very large magnetic fields, as is to be expected. And the BC2, the critical magnetic, uh, the critical magnetic field strength is much, much greater than the first critical magnetic field strength. And as a result, you can achieve this vortex state in between, where one of them is the BC2, which is much, much greater. One of them is the BC1. And you have this vortex state where the superconductor may not be behaving as a perfect superconductor, but it still is behaving as a superconductor. And you can get very large superconducting magnets, which work very efficiently. Now, with a type 1 superconductor, 
they are used in applications in measuring weak magnetic field strengths. In other words, very, very tiny magnetic field strengths, which is to be expected, because as we, as we said, type 1 superconductors behave as a now you see and now you don't sort of phenomena. And what they are used for is something known as squids. Squids are superconducting quantum interference devices. In other words, uh, magnetometers, as they are also known. And these guys can be used, for instance, in medical applications where you can measure the weak magnetic field changes of something like brain waves. Uh, or, for instance, you can measure the weak magnetic field strength changes of, for example, the human heart. Now, we'll wrap this discussion up by showing the most successful theory to date that explains superconductivity. This theory is known as the BCS theory, named after three scientists, Barding, Cooper, and Schieffer. And this theory can, I believe, best be represented graphically. Let's say you have electrons traveling through a particular substance, okay? Uh, let's say um, two electrons are traveling. It's buffering. Can you pause it?